This is Aliens and Artist, a special solo show in remembrance of John Mack. I'm Stuart Davis. In 2004, the world lost a true pioneer, and I lost a dear friend. Recently, someone shared with me this post I had put up in 2004, and revisiting it, it occurred to me how with the major events in ufology and abduction that have been shifting in recent years, I thought it would be appropriate to revisit and share with this podcast audience this remembrance of John Mack, published on September 30th, 2004, some 18 years ago. So, with love to John, this remembrance. I found out late last night that my dear friend John Mack had passed. He was apparently killed by a drunk driver in London in a crosswalk coming home at night from a gathering. John was one of my favorite people. I will miss him very much. He was a professor of psychiatry at a Harvard Medical School. His early work focused on dreams, nightmares, teen suicide, and how a person's worldview affects relationships. He was a Pulitzer Prize winner, author of several books, including A Prince of Our Disorder, Abduction, and Passport to the Cosmos. He started the Center for Psychology and Social Change, and also the Program for Extraordinary Experience Research, among much more. His work with the Program for Extraordinary Experience Research, or PEER, as it came to be known, included his research with experiencers of the alien abduction phenomenon. John had done extensive research with hundreds of people from around the world on the subject. He was featured in the 2003 documentary film Touched, as well as innumerable television and radio segments, including Oprah, at the height of that show's popularity. John discovered abduction experiencers came from all walks of life and were not mentally ill or crazy. This upset a lot of people in the academic world, surprise, surprise, and in 1994, Harvard formed a committee of peers to review his tenure and determine if they shouldn't revoke it, publicly castigate him, or cover their asses somehow. After 14 months, the school reaffirmed Dr. Mack's academic freedom to study what he wishes and to state his opinions without impediment. Now that's basically the obituary you're going to read in the papers around the world, but it doesn't say much. I knew John pretty well, and I would like to offer some details about this man's work and life, his great love for humanity, and the challenges he accepted in the interest of that love. I met John in 1994. I had read his book, Abduction, and was tremendously moved by it. In fact, that book was the inspiration for my song, Universe Communion, which appeared first on my CD, Self Untitled, also released in 1994, like that book. I sent him a copy of the disc, and he called me on the phone shortly after to say thanks and to chat a bit. And I remember how funny the conversation was, because he kept bringing up a different song on the CD. Not Universe Communion, which I'd written for him, but someone else's ears, because he thought that song ended too suddenly. He didn't want to talk about Universe Communion, he wanted to know about the ending to someone else's ears. He just wasn't sure, was it supposed to end that way, or was there something wrong with his CD? I tried to explain, no, John, it's actually supposed to end that way, it's an artistic tool, that abrupt ending. But hey, what do you think about that other song, Universe Communion? And he would go, oh, because it sounds like my CD is broken or something, like that song, Someone Else's Ears, maybe it's ending too abruptly. <laughs> and we went back and forth like this for quite a while. It was quite endearing, because as anyone knows who's had the pleasure of meeting John, he was a total sweetheart of a human being, instantly lovable. Each time I was with him, I was struck by his transparency, humility, and curiosity. He was 64 when I met him, and he sparkled like a diamond, and he was every bit as glowing when I had dinner with him for the last time about a year ago. Universe Communion was not the only song I've written which was inspired by John's work. The song Grays from the album Kid Mystic was another. In fact, there were undertones throughout that entire album that were influenced by my relationship with John and more importantly, his work with experiencers. I felt then, and still do now, that art 
is one of the most promising mediums for exploring and expressing a subject as nuanced and subtle as alien abduction, contact, and the broader anomalous phenomena which attends it. Not that my art has done a perfect job of it by any means, but simply that it has been an attempt to inhabit the trauma, wonder, and mystery that so often infuses these questions. John had a very tough gig in the world, being probably the very first major academic figure to publicly hold forth on the topic of abduction. The backlash was often pretty damn nasty. It's a funny thing about dogma, we usually associate a rigid adherence to doctrine with fundamentalist religion, with pre-rational worldviews. But science can, of course, be equally dogmatic. When it comes to a religion of rationality, uh, it has its own cachet of blind spots and assumptions. Rationality and the empirical method are wonderful. They ushered in the Enlightenment, gave us a miraculous new worldview on the inside and the outside. But the danger of dogmatic rationality is, not only does it despise what is pre-rational, such as mythic religion, for instance, it also despises, typically, what is trans-rational, such as authentic mysticism or transpersonal awareness. On top of that, the religion of rationality is utterly incapable of seeing the distinction between the two. It is unable to see that there is a difference between pre-rational and trans-rational stages of human development, realms of human experience, because to the materialist, to the reductionist, to the flatland empiricist, they are both simply not rational or irrational. This is a tragic collapse of what is a profoundly important distinction. A healthy scientist, an authentic empiricist, let's say, is capable of recognizing the limits of one mode of inquiry, however effective and potent it may be in its domain. This was the case with virtually every significant 20th century quantum physicist. Einstein, Schrodinger, Bohr, etc., etc. Their work in quantum physics led them beyond merely empirical methodologies into a sense of wonder and awe, described in their words as too mysterious, too deep for hard science to accommodate. That's because interiors exist, and physics is about the behavior and understanding of objective phenomena, not subjective experiencers. But they did not abandon their field, they did not forfeit the world that rationality had unveiled and explained, but they were introduced to another world that included trans-rationality, that went beyond but included the rational perspective, and realized both were inherent aspects of their very own being. Their rational capacities were still every bit as useful, in fact, even more beautiful, when viewed through a greater aperture, which included transrational insights and inquiry. They expressed it and explored it in unique ways, but they all crossed that threshold. Unfortunately, in the academic world, a simple axiom is often defended at all costs. If it's not rational, it must be irrational, and so irrelevant. Those perceived to be coming from outside the scientific community who present transrational findings or data, let's say research on the effects of prayer or psychic phenomena, which don't fit the consensus interpretation of reality, are fairly easily dismissed and caricatured as kooks. By example, neo-Darwinists like to play it as though anyone who doesn't ascribe to their theory of evolution is a fundamentalist, Bible-thumping moron. But the fact of the matter is, no one really has a clue how evolution actually works. How, for instance, eyesight ever emerged at all, much less simultaneously around the planet. It's a stunning unknown at this point. And although it seems that evolution does occur in biology, the fact remains that scientists don't know about what, how, when, or why for any of it. Chance mutations? <laughs> In a hundred years, Darwinism will be to evolutionary biology what leeches were to medicine. 
Yes, there was medicine 400 years ago, and there is medicine today. In which century would you prefer to be treated for a bacterial infection? Evolutionary biology will still be around in 100 years, but this ridiculous effort to prop up Darwinism over and over will be seen for what it was, a desperate attempt to keep the Bible thumpers at bay. Because the scientists know that they can't give the precious, rational world so hard won. They can't give that back to the pre-rational wackos. And they're right. The religious zealots can be pretty nasty about defending their church. They are correct that mythic imperialist religion is in fact pre-rational. But there is also literally a cosmos out there and in here that is full of transrational wonders. What is more difficult for the rationalist to dismiss is research and data that comes from within their community, from within the establishment, that calls into question any of the assumptions the community has internalized to the point of invisibility. They can't even see what their assumptions are anymore because the assumptions are part of their subject. They are fused with their interior identity. When human development occurs, the subject of one level of awareness becomes the object of the next level of awareness. So often to be able to perceive an assumption, we must move to a deeper or higher stage of awareness where we can disidentify from it so that we can see it and then we can operate on it. That which we can't see, that which is invisible, exerts an unconscious influence on us, or in this case, on a community. Now my point on that tangent is quite simple. John Max started asking transrational questions in the rational kingdom. Usually, someone brings up a subject like alien abduction, and the academic community can just whip out its old, he's a pre-rational wacko, response, and be done with it. But inconveniently, John was a Harvard professor, a Pulitzer Prize winner, an internationally recognized authority in psychiatry and transpersonal studies with decades of experience. And so, when John published his findings as a clinician and researcher on the alien abduction phenomenon and told the world, including academia, in effect, there's something mysterious going on here, and it's not pre-rational, it's transrational. It was much harder to immediately dismiss or discredit. Not that people didn't try. They did. They are still trying. And they will continue to try for as long as there are pre-rational, rational, and trans-rational worldviews, there will be healthy and pathological modes for each of them. Whatever you make of the alien abduction phenomenon is up to you. Just like spirituality, politics, evolution, the important question is, is your interpretation, your perspective of the matter formed by carefully considering all the available data and research, and then coming to a conclusion, aka an interpretation? I'm not here to tell you how to interpret the data on this phenomenon, and I don't really think John was either. He was passionate about making the information available to the public, about encouraging an interdisciplinary dialogue of inquiry. My experience of those who wholly dismiss the alien abduction topic as pre-rational wacko world is that they are never deeply informed. They are never truly familiar with the data, with the experiencers, and they are defending their rational religion. And the data on alien abductions, my friends, is confounding, perplexing, and mystifying. If you go into it with an open mind, it starts to fuck with your rational mind. That's all. It doesn't mean you have to forfeit your rational mind. It just means that something enigmatic is going on in the interior and the exterior lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world. People who have never encountered each other. People who come from all walks of life, stations of social standing, cultures, ages, races, sexes, and the experiences they report unmistakably, undeniably correspond and corroborate. Based on what we know from psychology, psychiatry, and affiliated fields, these people's experiences are not pathological. They are not crazy, mentally insane, or emotionally unstable. Conversely, 
They generally exhibit notably advanced positions in several lines of development, as a result sometimes from these traumatic histories, stigmatizing histories of exotic anomalous experiences. Now, as far as I can tell, here are a few of the ways we can interpret this worldwide phenomenon. One, in an historically unprecedented event, hundreds of thousands or millions, probably, of people have suddenly, simultaneously begun to mass hallucinate identical experiences of interacting with what they perceive to be sentient beings from another deeper dimension of reality. These hallucinations are a product of an entirely new order of collective consciousness, what we might think of as a nightmare in the new sphere, and have no actual external reality, but are a bizarre new feature in the collective interior of humanity. This would require us to accept that there is literally a psychic level interaction occurring all around the world among every imaginable type of person, and that its symptoms involve physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual components that do not fit our current interpretation of what is real. It would mean we've gone crazy, but in a very odd turn of events, this disease makes people more spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically advanced, and more caring for their fellow beings on the planet, as well as more conscious, compassionate citizens of the biosphere. But it's all the random product of a collective hallucination coming from within human interiors and projected as an other. Number two, beings from another world or another dimension are visiting us. Number three, something inexplicable is occurring around the world which we do not presently have sufficient perspective or development to understand. It challenges many of our scientific, social, and psychological assumptions about reality. It permeates gross, subtle, and causal dimensions and carries profound implications for our development as a species. We don't know exactly what it is or how to describe it. Now, which one of these interpretations of the alien abduction phenomenon, one, two, or three, is so trite that we can simply dismiss it? None of them, of course. Academia's vehement resistance to John Mack's work is in itself a bit telling. I read this in one of John's obituaries. It's a quote from some attorney named Roderick McLeish, who represented John during Harvard's investigation on whether to revoke his tenure. Quote, he was so caring to his patients, and I hope that is what he is remembered for, and not for being the guy who believed in people's stories of alien abductions. End quote. And if I were quoted in Roderick McLeish's obituary, I would say, quote, Roderick was a good person and a great lawyer, and I hope that's what he's remembered for, and not for being an unabashed reductionist and prisoner to his own dogmatic rational mind. End quote. Sorry if I'm a bit touchy about this, Roderick, but at the time of John's passing, to make such a statement in a mainstream paper seems to me to be sleazy and a traitorous move. That's true. Especially considering what John went through in his life, what he came up against in doing this important work, and might I add, all the while enduring it with love and light and an infectious appreciation of the miracle of what it is to be alive. I believe this is the time we recognize what a visionary this extraordinary man was, and not a time for small-minded, backhanded quips from supposed friends. And that's the thing. Mostly, I'll miss John as my friend. I adored him, loved hanging out with him, talking philosophy, spirituality, psychology, science, and the infinite puzzle of being. My life will always be richer for having known him, and this planet is a better place because he was on it. John, it is with much love and gratitude that I thank you for your amazing presence in our lives, for your gifts to humanity, and indeed all beings everywhere. May your radiant soul be received by its source and continue to illuminate from the point of all places. Oh
falling snow on the back of a gliding crow. Of a crow, of a crow, of a crow. Thank you.